out at sea. The 19th voyage began like any other. The ship sat in the Mersey River in Liverpool, England, as the ship was inspected and re-inspected. When passengers climbed up the gangways, one of the first things they saw on board the ship was a nameplate mounted onto the side of the deckhouse. This nameplate is called the quarterboard. It shows the ship's name. It's 11 feet long. Uh, and it's pretty neat because uh, it uh, hung over uh, a woman's uh, fireplace in her cottage for 50 years, and she donated it to us two years ago. Another special piece of identification that the steamer Atlantic proudly flew was the White Star Line flag. We have the flag. Uh, the flag was donated to us by the uh, captain's great-grandson. He's an American. It's purported to be the flag from the Atlantic, but there's no way of proving that. The flag itself has a long history. Uh, it has traveled across North America several times and been in displays as far away as California and Florida. It's pretty raggedy, so uh, it may well be off the Atlantic. The passengers of the Atlantic were permitted to board the ship the night before the voyage and stay on board as the last of the cargo was loaded into her holds. In her hold, the Atlantic would carry several crates of hotel china, pocket knives, costumes and costume jewelry, and many other goods. In addition to these, almost 1,000 tons of coal are loaded into the ship's coal bunkers. The chief engineer was confident that this would be enough coal to bring the ship from Liverpool to New York City. It always had been. Chief Engineer John Foxley had been with the Atlantic nearly since the beginning of the ship's career. He'd been with the ship for all but three of her voyages, and he likely knew the ship better than anyone else on board. Foxley reported directly to the ship's captain, a Welshman named James Williams. Williams was with the White Star Line since 1871 and had worked his way up from second officer on the Republic. He held the highest degree of certification from the British Board of Trade, but he wasn't without his flaws. He was allegedly fired from the Guion Line for drunkenness on duty, though the director of the Guion Line would continue to defend him even after his termination. Unlike later steamships, where chief and first officer were two separate positions, on many of the old ships, including the Atlantic, the chief officer was the first officer. Chief Officer John Firth was new to the White Star Line. This was only his second voyage with the company. He had been a captain before for ships in the Mediterranean, but he dropped in rank in order to sign up for the new White Star Line, hoping to rise to captain once more. Second Officer Henry Metcalf has had a rocky career. Four years prior, he was in command of the SS Explorer when it ran down the SS Britannia. Metcalf was charged with neglect and had his certification suspended. At the time of the Atlantic, he had just gotten his certification reinstated. He would soon be on duty at the time of yet another sea disaster. Third Officer Cornelius Brady and Fourth Officer John Brown may have been the lowest ranked officers, but they were well equipped to operate a steamer and had a collective 30 years of experience as commanders. The Atlantic didn't carry any celebrities or individuals to command their own influence on history, like some of those aboard the Titanic or Lusitania, but that doesn't mean that there weren't people on board with interesting backgrounds or stories worth mentioning. Musician Albert Sumner was traveling in cabin class. Sumner was a church organist, and for people who enjoy hymns, they may recognize his work. Lauriston Davidson was the widow of Captain Alexander Davidson of New Zealand. Most of her family had passed away, so she and her 17-year-old daughter are traveling to the United States to seek out her brother in Telegraph City, California. Many of the ship's passengers even the ones traveling in the upper class are immigrating to the United States. The mass migration from Europe is only just beginning, and crossing the Atlantic is still seen as a dangerous and arduous undertaking. In some cases, the man of the family would travel ahead of the rest of his family and seek his fortunes, and then he'd call on his family to come and meet him once he's settled. 
In other cases, entire families would travel together. On the Atlantic, there was a mixture of all of this. There were men traveling ahead of their families to make their way to the American frontiers. There were women and children traveling to meet their men. And there were entire families traveling as a group. On March 20th, the Atlantic weighs anchor and makes her way towards the Irish Sea.